What do expats need to know about investing in property? In this video, we'll go through the main areas that expats tend to find the hardest, starting with mortgages, then finding a property, managing a property, and then tax. Tax in particular is a really important and tricky area, so make sure you stick around for that. Let's start with mortgages, which can be a difficult area for expats, but you pay less tax and have better weather, so... Expats can get mortgages in the UK, and both personal and limited company loans are both pretty much equally available, but the range that you'll have to choose from depends on a lot of different factors. A big one is where abroad you live. Lenders like some countries more than others, with perceived corruption being a big factor. So your job in South Sudan might pay well, but that's just as well, because you'll probably be buying with cash. Lenders also like it if you work for a big multinational employer because they perceive it as more secure and it's easier for them to check your employment details. And they want you to have a footprint in the UK still. So that means a UK bank account, a UK correspondence address, and a credit file with either a credit card or an existing mortgage on it. If you've got a buy select property already, maybe what used to be your home and you're now renting it out, then that's ideal. If you don't tick all the dream client boxes that we've just been through, then that's okay. You'll probably still have options, but they will be fewer, and so you'll probably end up paying a higher rate. It is really complex, so to pick your way through it all, do work with a mortgage broker who's experienced at working with expats. They'll probably be able to find you a better deal that you didn't even know existed, and at the very least, they'll be able to save you time and stress by dealing with the lender on your behalf. Stick around to learn about tax, but you won't have any tax to pay unless you find a property to buy, so let's cover that next. Some expats are in a position to do all their research online, then come back to the UK and do a couple of days of concentrated viewings themselves. But if that's not your situation, then you're gonna to have to find a way to outsource some or all of that process. You can find people who will find suitable properties, view them, negotiate for you, and basically handle every aspect of the process. This is something that we do for a lot of expat clients at Property Hub Invest, and we'll drop a link to that below in case it's something you want to check out. But there are plenty of other companies and individuals that you can use as well. The challenge, of course, is who do you trust? A good tip that was given by my friend John, who runs a podcast called Expat Property Story, we'll link to that below as well, is to approach rather than be approached. In other words, be really cautious if somebody comes to you out of the blue with lots of big promises. Instead, do your research, seek people out, maybe based on recommendations, and you approach them. It's also super important to have your own knowledge up to speed. So even if you're not doing everything yourself, you can still validate what you're being told. Another option is to do all the research and talking to agents and everything else yourself and just find someone else who can do the actual viewings for you in your absence. If you Google property viewing services, you'll find some options, or you might be able to find a local investor who can do it for you as well. It can feel uncomfortable to make such a big commitment without setting foot in the place yourself, but photos and videos, especially if taken by someone who knows what they're doing, can be pretty much as good. As an expat, you're just not gonna be able to do everything yourself, so you have to find a way of getting comfortable with putting trust in others for some parts of the process. So that's three options. Do it yourself on trips back, find someone to do it all for you, or do all the research yourself and just find someone to do the viewings. Which model is right for you will be a mix of personal preference and practicalities like time zones and how much free time you have. One last thing that you need to watch out for when finding a property is some lenders have a minimum property value criteria, which can be £200,000 or higher. So do check that out with your broker before you go looking. Let's move on to actually securing a property that you found. And for everyone, this is part of the process that's much longer and more annoying than it should be. But there are also particular hurdles that expats need to look out for. Something that really helps is working with a solicitor who you've actually already met in person. So if you can make that happen on a trip back to the UK, then do so. It depends on the lender and the situation, but it can avoid the need to have documents certified overseas, which often involves extra hassle and cost. During the process, your lender will probably want to make contact with your employer to confirm your salary and position. So be prepared to talk to your employer about that and get that done. A lender will also want to see proof of where your deposit funds have come from. So ideally, really straightforward, they'll have been building up in your UK bank account for many months. But if they've suddenly arrived from somewhere else, then do be prepared to provide paperwork taking it all the way back to the source. However organised you are, the conveyancing process does involve a lot of chasing, and time differences can make that harder. I spent a time having to make 1am phone calls for a bit when I was living abroad, and don't be surprised if you have to do the same. Once you've finally acquired the property, then you'll need to get it managed on your behalf. We can mostly skip over this because it's pretty much the same for expats as it is for residents, but do let us know in the comments if you'd like us to make more videos about that side of things. 
It's not impossible to self-manage and just rely on local tradespeople as needed to do whatever jobs come up, but in practice it's pretty inconvenient and I barely know any expats who do that themselves. It's much more common to use a managing agent and here the same rules apply that we talked about earlier. Ask for recommendations, check references, and meet them in person when you're in the UK to build up a bit of a relationship if you can. Okay, so now you have an income stream and an asset that's hopefully gonna go up in value, which is great news for HMRC, who are gonna want their slice of it. If you're buying as an individual, you'll need to register for self-assessment with HMRC, and if you're a company, then there will be corporation tax returns to deal with every year. Either way, you'll probably want to use an accountant to deal with this on your behalf, most expats do. You'll also need to register for something called the Non-Resident Landlord Scheme and file a form called the NRL1 for every property. If you don't do that, then your letting agent will need to deduct the basic rate of tax before they pass the rent over to you each month. You're gonna end up paying tax anyway, so you might think it's not a big deal, but it's far better if they don't do that and you can just sort it out yourself at the end of the year, because otherwise you might end up paying more tax than you need to and end up having to claim it back. So that's the day-to-day -day tax matters. Beyond that, the real key thing is to get the structure right before you start, because it can be very expensive or even impossible to make changes to your tax structure once you already own the property. The right structure will very much depend on your plans, including whether you plan to return to the UK to work as an employee again in the future, because that will determine whether you should own the property individually or as a company. Capital gains tax can also become significant down the line, and hopefully it will, because that means that you've got an asset that's gone up in value a lot. But whether you sell the property while you're still abroad or back in the UK can make a big difference, so do take advice on that. Planning is everything, so working with a good tax advisor from the start is super important. So there are extra challenges for expats at every stage, but the core strategies and the goals that you can achieve with property are the same as for anyone else. One of those is turning £100,000 into a million pounds, and in this next video, we tell you how to do exactly that.